So this week, um, we are going to start talking about the causes of the Civil War. And um, there were quite a few reasons why the American Civil War happened, but we'll specifically talk about uh, three or four of them in this week's PowerPoint. We also are going to look at some of the important people that were involved in um, the, the events that led up to the Civil War as well. So let's get started. The number one reason why the Civil War happened, the number one cause of the Civil War, there were multiple causes, three or four or five different causes, but the number one cause, and it's bigger than any other cause, and in fact contributes to all the other cause, the number one cause of the Civil War is slavery, or was slavery. Slavery was a... Um, Slavery was something that was going on in the South that the Southerners absolutely refused to give up. While the people in the North had, uh, all the states in the North had made slavery illegal, and um, many people were becoming abolitionists, which were people that were speaking out against slavery. But the Southern economy, specifically because of cotton, as you see in the picture on the right on the bottom here, the Southern economy was very reliant on having lots of people to work and they wanted free workers which were slaves and this was the number one reason why the american people went to war against themselves during the civil war another cause of the civil war was economic and social differences between the north and the south now let me explain that a little bit by looking at this chart if you take a look at the chart you can see the huge huge differences between the north and the south the northern states look at the population difference 21.5 million versus 9 million there were 12 and a half million more people living in the north than the south that's a that's a big difference the number of factories Remember we talked about in the Industrial Revolution unit a few weeks ago, we talked about how the uh, there was a lot of factories in the north and not a lot in the south. Well, here you can see that from this chart. Uh, five times as many factories in the north. The amount of railroads, three times as many railroads, nearly three times as many railroads. Why is having more railroads more important? Well, guess what? When it came time to having the war, when the Civil War happened, the northern... Uh, the northern side, the Union was able to move troops and supplies much faster because of all of the miles of railroad they had. And so that made a huge, huge difference. Uh, bank deposits, just the amount of money people had. You see that this is more than four times as much for the North. The only advantage the South had in terms of these uh, differences was their cotton production and we've talked about cotton production before but if you see this in the north only 4,000 bales uh, were produced per year whereas in the south 5 million bales um, during the 1850s and so you can see the huge huge differences between the north and the south from economic standpoint there was also big social differences between the north and the south for example in the north um, people, many, many more people lived in the cities. In the South, it was much more of a country life and this, this concept of the aristocracy or people caring about their status and it was a very laid back lifestyle. In the North, things were, there were factories. In the South, there were farms and plantations. The North was fast paced. The South was laid back and slow paced. In the North, there was virtually there was no slaves because slavery had been made illegal so they were not dependent on slave labor at all whereas in the south as we talked about before with the cotton slavery was a huge huge uh, factor for the south so these social differences also made a huge difference in leading up to the civil war Another cause of the Civil War was states' rights versus federal rights. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, the federal government had certain powers given to it under the Constitution. The states also had certain powers given to it under the Constitution. You can see that in the Tenth Amendment that I have in this picture here. The Tenth Amendment said the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it, uh, no, nor prohibited it to the states. They're reserved for the states. In other words, that's a fancy way of saying if the Constitution doesn't give a certain right to the federal government in Washington, D.C., every those rights are then given to the states. 
and um, the word nullification a little vocab word here of nullification is basically states had the right to rule certain federal acts unconstitutional if they felt like the Constitution did not give them those uh, the ability to to do that and the states rights versus federal rights was a big contention of the South especially when it came to the issue of slavery and taxes so uh, those are the three causes that we're going to really focus on uh, as we talk about the Civil War and um, let's then talk about some key events and people that led up to the Civil War happening. Well, number one, let's define what an abolitionist is. Anyone who attempted to end slavery by speaking out, by writing, or by assisting runaway slaves was considered an abolitionist. And maybe um, one of the greatest examples of this was the Underground Railroad. The Underground Railroad was a secret network that helped slaves escape from the South by providing food, shelter, and guidance. And uh, there was lots of different ways that the Underground Railroad happened. Sometimes the um, when slaves were running away, they would be able to stop at different farmhouses or barns. And if it was okay for them to stop there, there might be a secret code that they would put a quilt in the window. And if that quilt was in the window, it was safe to stop there. If the quilt wasn't in the window, then you knew that it wasn't safe to stop there. You had to go on to the next stop. The most famous person uh, of the Underground Railroad was Harriet Tubman. She was an escaped slave herself who made 19 different trips back to the South, risking her own life so she could help people escape. She was able to rescue more than 300 slaves, which is pretty amazing. Another thing about Harriet Tubman that's um, interesting to note is that she would always carry a pistol with her. And if a slave decided that they wanted to try to go back to their slave owner, that they got worried that they were going to be caught, they wanted to go back to their slave owner, Harriet Tubman would point the pistol at the slave and say, you can't go back. You're coming with me. And the slave inevitably would turn around and stay with her and keep going to their freedom. But why did Harriet Tubman do that? Well, she did that because if the slave went back to their master, they could be tortured and forced to tell information about um, the Underground Railroad and some of the stops on the railroad. One interesting thing, though, about this story is that Harriet Tubman had that pistol with her, and yet she never put a bullet in it. She never loaded it. It was always unloaded. When she would point that at the slave, the slave didn't know it, but there was no bullet in it. She never had any intention of shooting a runaway slave. She just wanted to use that to help them understand what the importance of why they needed to keep going on their journey. So, uh, a couple more key terms in people. Uh, we have uh, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Really, really important really really important and and the reason why this is important the fugitive slave act is important is because um, you had a situation where you had a situation where the um, the fugitive slave act is important the fugitive slave act of 1850 was important because it made it a federal crime to assist runaway slaves Literally, you could be put in jail or face up to a $1,000 fine if you assisted runaway slaves. And this was a very big deal because um, many people in the North had been helping slaves up to this point. And after the Fugitive Slave Act comes out, you could now be, be arrested, put in jail, fined for giving assistance to runaway slaves. And that was really, really a big deal. Um, Frederick Douglass was, in, you see in the picture here, he's probably one of the most famous abolitionists of this time. He did a lot of writing. He was, he was a former slave. He did a lot of writing um, on how um, slavery was evil and should be ended. Well, uh, we also want to talk for a moment about a little bit of local history, something that happened right here uh, in Pennsylvania during uh, the lead up until the Civil War. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was passed and a year later in 1851 an event called the Christiana Riot happened. Um, if you see the historical marker in the picture here, I'll just read that. It says in 1850 the Federal Fugitive Slave Act strengthened the position of slave owners seeking to capture runaway slaves. Pursuing four escaped slaves, Maryland farmer Edward, Edward Gorsuch, 
arrived September 11, 1851 at Christiana home of William Parker, an African-American who was giving them refuge. Neighbors gathered, fighting ensued, and Gorsuch was killed. The incident, the incident did much to polarize the national debate over the issue of slavery. And so essentially what happened was, um, right in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, right near Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in a, a small town called Christiana, slaves were hiding at the home of a free African-American. And their slave owner from Maryland, his name was Edward Gorsuch, he came to try to take them back. And he said, and he basically said, under the power of the Fugitive Slave Act, you got to turn those slaves over to me. And William Parker, the owner of the house where the slaves were hiding, said, no way. And a fighting uh, broke, broke out. And as a result, um, the largest treason trial in the United States history happens where 37 African Americans and, and one white man were put on trial for treason because they didn't follow the Fugitive Slave Act. And um, most of them end up being found, or they're acquitted, they're not found guilty of treason. Um, because, because of how much attention this uh, Christiana riot got in the newspapers all around the country, it brought a lot of attention to this issue of slavery, especially the issue of Northerners saying, why should we be forced to um, return slaves to the South when we don't believe in slavery? And this is just one more incident that was helping lead us to the, that kept leading towards the Civil War, which started in 19, in 1860, in 1860. Two important government decisions would lead us on a track to the Civil War as well. The first one was the 1820 Missouri Compromise. We learned about this about a month or two ago. And the Missouri Compromise uh, was when Missouri wanted to join the country as a slave state right here. Um, however, if they would have joined the country, it would have made the uh, it would have made the count of slave states higher than the count of free states at the time in 1820. So Maine. It was decided that Maine would come on as a free state. So Maine was a free state. Missouri was a slave state. And then they drew a line. And it was the 3630 latitude line across the country. And they said that any future states, uh, any future states that were north of the line up here would be free states. Any future states south of the line down here would be slave states. And so the idea was that that way they would keep the division of slave states and free states intact. Well, that was in 1820. If we fast forward 30 years, there's going to be a problem. You see this, the 3630 line right here is going west. Well, as it goes west, you can see a future state out here that's going to be cut in half. The Compromise of 1850. 30 years after the Missouri Compromise, here we are, and it's 1850, and California wants to come into the Union as a free state. The problem is that imaginary line from the Missouri Compromise goes right through the middle of California. So now what happens? Do we make, do we split California in half and have the north part be free and the south be slave? What do we do? California really wanted to be a free state. And so the Compromise of 1850 was struck. And what it did was, number one, the southern states said, we'll allow California to become a free state, but we want something in return. And so that something in return was the Fugitive Slave Law. And the Fugitive Slave Law, or the Fugitive Slave Act, either one is acceptable. The Fugitive Slave Act, what it did was, as we talked about with the Christiana riot, it made it illegal to help runaway slaves in northern states. Federal marshals could literally arrest you if you were harboring runaway slaves. And so now, many runaway slaves on the Underground Railroad with Harriet Tubman couldn't just try to escape to Ohio or Pennsylvania. They had to go all the way to Canada to feel like they were totally free. Because if they were hiding out in one of these northern states at any point in time, federal marshals could knock on the door and take them back to the south. So California, as part of the Compromise of 1850, California became a free state, even though half of it was below the 3630 line. And the Southerners, in return, they got the Fugitive Slave Law, which made it very difficult. Well, what happened when the Fugitive Slave Law came out is that, basically, Northerners got mad about it. 
because they didn't feel that slavery was right. And they started to ignore the fugitive slave law. They continued to help um, runaway slaves. And this made Southerners angry. Again, one of these things where the North and the South are butting heads and getting mad at each other, that's going to eventually lead to the Civil War. Another thing that adds to leading to the Civil War was the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. Uh, Stephen Douglas, a senator from Illinois, proposed that residents of Kansas and Nebraska should get to decide whether they want to be a free state or a slave state. The vocab term for this is called popular sovereignty. And so residents of Kansas got to vote uh, on whether they wanted to be a free state or a slave state. Well, when this happened, people from all around the country that were pro-slavery and anti-slavery started to go and move to Kansas. Lots and lots of people moved to Kansas because they wanted to be able to vote either for slavery in Kansas or against slavery in Kansas. And all of these people that were for slavery and against slavery that were basically coming together in Kansas, it, was, it led to a lot of violence. And this violence became known as Bleeding Kansas. Throughout 1854, pro-slavery and anti-slavery groups were fighting with each other, and over 200 people ended up being killed. One of the most famous incidents during that was the Potawatomi Massacre, which was led by John Brown and his sons. John Brown, if you've already watched the, the uh, John Brown video from this week and taken the quiz, you know a little bit about him, but he was very um, anti-slavery. He believed slavery was wrong, and he was trying to stop it. And he was willing to use violence in order to try to stop it. And him and his sons came across some pro-slavery people in Kansas. And they talked to them and they said, hey, why are you pro-slavery? They had a conversation. And the pro-slavery people said, we're pro-slavery. And John Brown and his sons basically ended up in an, a violent altercation with these people. And um, five people end up being killed as John Brown and his sons use machetes to uh, basically fight against them and kill them. So that was part of the Bleeding Kansas of 1854. Again, one more incident along the way that's leading us toward the Civil War in 1860. Well, many different people had various opinions and different opinions about slavery. And some of these important people uh, from this time frame are John C. Calhoun, Thaddeus Stevens, Abraham Lincoln, and James Buchanan. And it's important that you understand that there really were four different opinions about slavery. John C. Calhoun was from South Carolina. He's from the South. And you could probably guess what his opinion was. He was all about keeping slavery. He wanted to keep it and protect it and expand it. He thought slavery was a good thing. Thaddeus Stevens, a congressman from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, was actually um, in secret married to an African-American, um, a free African-American lady. And so he was all about ending slavery immediately. He said it was wrong. It was terrible. It was, uh, it was a sin. And he wanted to get rid of slavery. He said it was wrong all the way. Now, our 16th president, who you've heard of and certainly know, uh, Abraham Lincoln, he really wasn't sure about his opinion about slavery, but he basically said this, don't let slavery spread into new areas, but it can exist where it's at right now. So that was kind of an interesting um, take on it. He believed that slavery would eventually die away if we just kept it contained to where it was right now. And then finally, our 15th president of the United States, a man from Pennsylvania, um, our only president from Pennsylvania, James Buchanan, James Buchanan said, don't rock the boat. He didn't want to make anybody mad, whether they were pro-slavery or anti-slavery. He didn't want to make anybody mad. And finally today, um, I just want to tell you a short story about James Buchanan, our only president from Pennsylvania. He also was the only single president. Um, James Buchanan never got married. And um, Buchanan ends up Buchanan, Buchanan ends up taking his niece with him to the White House to serve in the function of first lady. So she's the one who plans parties and picks out the curtains and the carpet and things like that for the for the White House when she when Buchanan becomes president. But James Buchanan uh, has a local tie to us right here in um, Lebanon County. He was um, dating a woman from Lebanon County named Ann Coleman. Now, you may recognize that last name, Coleman, because Coleman's Park in Lebanon County is named after Ann Coleman's father, Robert Coleman. And Ann Coleman and James Buchanan were dating, and 
Buchanan thought that he was going to marry Ann Coleman. And Buchanan went on a trip to Philadelphia, a business trip. And while he was on that trip to Philadelphia, he stopped at one, at some point he stopped and apparently visited uh, a former girlfriend. Well, the former girlfriend wrote a letter to Ann Coleman saying, guess what? James came to visit me. And Ann Coleman was so upset by this that she called off um, her her marriage with James Buchanan, and she actually ends up dying um, a few months later. Of uh, n- n- historians aren't really sure what she died from, but she dies maybe from um, some sort of sickness or possibly from um, taking too much medicine or something like that. And James Buchanan is so heartbroken by this that he never ends up marrying and thus becomes the only um, the only single president uh, in U.S. history uh, and the only president from Pennsylvania. So that's it for this week's um, video about the causes of the Civil War. What you want to do now is go ahead and take the uh, exam, the small exam that goes with this. If you aren't sure about any of the questions, go back and rewatch the video and um, then take the quiz.